There, we, there it is. All right, all right. So let's talk about the I3 consortium. Um, we've been working on I3, the I3 project now, for a little over three years, maybe a bit, bit longer. What we started to realize was that going after um, smart cities and IOTs as a series of siloed applications where you think about applications talking to devices, then lining up the next one and the next one, inherently has its limits as you start to scale. And in fact, the scaling issue becomes sort of um, a, a, a two to the end kind of factor as you start trying to interconnect and interconnect more data, the problem to get more complicated. So the issues that we're talking about today, when we think forward where we're going to be three, four, five years from now are even going to get more complicated unless we solve some of the fundamental underlying issues early on. Um, what we wanted to do was create and shift from sort of an application-driven process to one where we start thinking about IoT devices and the applications as separable sort of networks that are connected together so that any device can connect to any application um, across a, a, a fabric that, that connects them. What this does is actually some interesting things when you start thinking about IoT as a network-focused application in that instead of trying to justify each application based on uh, looking at the application benefits to derive and, and justify the cost of the devices, you actually start thinking about the devices being supported by a number of applications that it supports. So that moves us from a situation where we're trying to justify a set of applications and devices on a standalone basis to a much more fluid in environment. And this lets us justify a lot more applications than we could have otherwise. The other thing that's interesting that starts to happen is instead of each application having to know about all the devices that it communicates to, it actually can see a much broader strength of, of devices underneath it. That allows more data to flow to the applications and it thereby lets applications make better uh, decisions. This is especially important when we start moving toward artificial applications where the more data actually allows for more intelligent making. Um, this is actually something, when we thought about I3, it's not something that, that the, the engineering school or the business school sort of figured out, or even with the city of LA, but it's only when we came together and started to think about the problem as a multidisciplinary problem that some of these, these um, insights began and sort of, again, it's sort of an aha moment. What we were doing, and, and there were several aha moments, but one of them that I think was especially interesting was the idea that when we started thinking about data as a valued commodity that could be traded between consumers and producers, when you start thinking about that, it sort of changes your mindset about how you want to freely trade things. Scott, when you talked earlier about the importance of trust, when you start thinking about a data marketplace, the value and the importance of trust sort of goes exponential in terms of why it's important and need to understand and how do you maintain trust. The other thing that we thought about is we think about things, trust, as being something that's very personal. Um, the way that I view trust and the way that someone else views trust might be very different. It's also a very dynamic environment when you start thinking about trust. Trust you can earn and gain trust. And it's also by doing things you can lose trust. So trust is not this fixed thing that you can apply a constant rule about how you do it and where you go. You have to think about how do you manage trust over its evolutionary cycle. And that's really the environment that we were trying to create. Um, we, we came to the conclusion, actually, although we were working with the city of LA on this, that we decided we want to take the work that we're doing, and once it's realized, we want to release it as open source so that other cities can sort of follow in the path of what we're doing and build and contribute into the process. So that's definitely the direction that we're going, and that's part of why we became an action cluster under the data super cluster. Um, to talk a little bit about the way that we think about this, we, we instead of going from the siloed structure, we talked about putting the I3 domain controller in between the two. In its very basic essence, it sits there as a transparent data manager, a real-time manager. It's not a full-fledged IoT solution. There's a lot of stuff that, like the data lakes and data repositories and AI engines that we're not trying to address. We're trying to focus our attention strictly on that. How do you make sure that you connect the data producers with the data consumers? And that's really what I3 is focused on. It's a defined problem. It's something that we think we can tackle in, in the way we do that. Of course, part of this is that you have to give people permissions and let them, so that whoever owns the device is actually feels like they're a participatory 
involved in the process. So they need to have read, write, access, and be able to say who gets their data, who doesn't get their data, what they can do with it, what they can't do with it. And of course, they need to be able to go in and change these permissions as maybe the next day they change their mind where they're going and what they want to do. So it has to be a very fluid managed interface between the two of them, where the people are always involved. Now, trying to get people comfortable to where they want to participate in that process, um, not just the reads and write, but you can think about the data that it, it, it generates. You can think about giving the device owners have to give permission to the applications to see the data. The other thing that becomes important, because we're sort of thinking about this as a very open and fluid architecture, that means that you need to have people participate in the process in terms of saying which data do they trust and where they're giving, do they trust the application who's getting their data. At the same token, the applications need to think back and say, is that trusted application there as well? That second side is really important to understand. We're trying to think ahead, just like there's fake news is in, the, in, in there today. In the future, there will be fake IoT data as people are sort of trying to drive and change the behavior of the network. So you actually have to think through some of the things that we're seeing in social network and how it applies in an IoT world as well. Trust rating on the, on the application side, incentives. Um, we talked earlier about data policy and usage perspective. When an application wants to see the data that is coming, that's pot potentially available to it, you have to talk about your data policies. You have to talk about why do I want to use them? What are the incentives involved? And then there's the question of trust, because certainly the more that uh, a device owner trusts you, the lower the incentives need to be. So there becomes this dynamic interface where people are sort of managing it like a financial transaction. It becomes a very fluid and easy to manage environment. The other thing that we think about a little bit when we're going through this is what's the definition of trust, of uh, security. Security actually, when you think about security, you can't talk about it in its, its entirety. You've got to sort of start compartmentalizing and think about what does it mean at the different layers through the system. If an application is getting data from an IoT device, they might not be seeing the data that's going to other applications and other places, so that doesn't give you a holistic view if you're trying to look at IoT devices to see which ones are misbehaving. So by moving that further down and closer to the device, you have a whole more holistic view, and you can start doing pattern matching if you want to by looking for devices that are behaving in a way that was not expected. If you want, you can think about that as when you use your credit card, how the credit card companies monitor for usage in unexpected patterns, and how do you apply that kind of a concept in an IoT environment. That becomes something that's very important to think about. Now, we're working with this on the city of LA. The city of LA is, is sort of our, our touchstone. It's, it's probably one of the larger cities. Um, it covers almost 500 square miles, um, lots and lots of people. One of the things that the city did is early in the process, they sort of scoped out and tried to figure out what it would cost to, um, to deploy a smart city across the entirety of, the, of LA city. And it gets to be a pretty big number pretty quick. One of the things that was important to the city is not just breaking down the departmental silos that exist between the departments, and that we want actually the departments to start sharing data between each other and supporting each other, um, but we also thought about how do we bring in and let the citizens participate and contribute the data that they do. Um, so if you can think about maybe a house outside who's got a security camera, how can they contribute that camera data to the city police department so that the city doesn't need to replicate all the devices that the citizens already have done? If we can start leveraging some of the city, if we can start leveraging the data, we just had a presentation on smart buildings, if we can start leveraging the data from landlords into the operations of the city, private landlords, that's a really good thing um, because that saves the city a bunch of money. Um, so that's ultimately where we're trying to get to. This also has implications when you start thinking about how do you take city data and share it with the state authorities in a way that you can sort of quickly go in and turn on or turn off data flows. Um, maybe if there's a time of crisis, you want to have one set of data policy. During the crisis is over, you sort of revert back and have a different set of data policy. So you can sort of change this dynamically. Now, where we're at, um, the I3 consortium is, I think it's 31 members right now. Um, so we're pretty much through most of the thinking through and in, in our design processes. We're about to start implementation phase as to where we're going to. Um, our goal is to have something um, at the, the February conference that's coming up, uh, tentatively scheduled for February. 
Um, so we're in the realization phase. We've got several proof of concepts we've done already, um, done through the engineering school, and we're starting to try and take and turn the software to make it commercially viable so that we can release it through open source and other people can pick up and follow what we've been doing. Um, we're hoping that long term what we want to do is have this generally available so that any city can download and run the software hopefully this time next year. Um, and of course we're looking for people who want to participate in the process. Um, the more people who sort of help shoulder the burden of the development, I mean that means we can go faster, the more resources, that's all goodness um, and that's kind of where we're going. Thank you.